welcome to the first episode of Hong Kong Watch's new series, Conversations with Benedict Rogers. Uh, and I am Benedict Rogers, the co-founder and chair uh, of Hong Kong Watch. And it's a very great pleasure and privilege uh, to welcome as our first guest in this series, the very first episode of this series, someone who really needs no introduction. Uh, he's known as the father uh, of Hong Kong's democracy movement. Uh, he's one of Hong Kong's most senior barristers, uh, the founder of Hong Kong's Democratic Party, and someone who uh, helped to draft Hong Kong's basic law. And of course, on the 18th of April, uh, he came back from his morning walk and found, along with 14 of his colleagues, uh, that he was uh, under uh, arrest. Martin Lee, it's a great pleasure to welcome you as our first guest uh, on this series, and thank you so much for making time to be with us. I'm, I'm sure you count me as your first guest because I'm the oldest. <laughs> well, may, maybe uh, maybe in age, but but also in in distinction in terms of your commitment to the democracy movement, <laughs> and the latter is more important. <laughs> That's why I want to show my white hair to you. <laughs> well, having having walked with you uh, on the streets of London, I know that you may be the oldest in terms of age, but you're certainly uh, uh, far more active than people half your age. So, uh, so thank you for for uh, being with us, Martin. Um, my first question for you: There are three documents uh, that are essential to understanding uh, the political situation in Hong Kong. The situation for human rights, democracy, the rule of law, autonomy, uh, the Sino-British Joint Declaration, uh, Hong Kong's basic law, and then Xi Jinping's uh, white paper. And I wondered if you could tell us uh, why these three documents uh, are important and what, respectively, they mean for Hong Kong. Well, in the early 1980s, Deng Xiaoping, the then paramount leader of China, wanted to get Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau back. And he was looking at the possible date of 1997. It's important because under, the, under one of the three treaties uh, China made with Great Britain after the Opium War, um, the new territories was leased to Great Britain for 99 years. Although Hong Kong Island and Kowloon Peninsula were actually ceded to Great Britain forever. So Deng Xiaoping wanted to get the whole thing back. And, uh, but of course, more importantly, he was looking at Taiwan. And then, so he wanted to resume the exercise of jurisdiction of sovereignty, rather. He wanted to, re sorry, uh, he wanted to resume the exercise of sovereignty over Hong Kong, Kowloon, and the new territories on the 1st of July, 1937. And to make that possible, he needed Great Britain's agreement to do so, because there were these two treaties. And so he began to have a dialogue with Margaret Thatcher, who was then the Prime Minister. And I understand from reading books that uh, era that Margaret Thatcher's original position was, OK, the new territories would have to be returned, but not Hong Kong and Kowloon. And then it was pointed out to her her own advices, the old China hands, that it was not possible for Great Britain to hold on to Hong Kong and Kowloon Peninsula alone without the new territory. So she then changed her position into trying to give Hong Kong, Kowloon and the new territories back to China, but in return to have China to grant a lease of the whole lot back to Great Britain for something like 50 years. But Deng Xiaoping won't have that. But he realized that if he simply took Hong Kong back just like that, all the people in Hong Kong who could afford to leave would leave. And overseas investors would pull out of Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is not worth taking back, really. So Deng Xiaoping then finally made the concession which is written down in the Joint Declaration. In other words, you, 
Great Britain will not rule Hong Kong for those 15 years, neither would we. But we allow Hong Kong people to rule Hong Kong for 50 years with a high degree of autonomy. Meaning, apart from defense and foreign affairs, Hong Kong people will be masters of their own house. So that was the idea which finally became the Final British Joint Declaration. And uh, Great Britain did what was considered to be necessary, in other words, to make out, to sit, get down a lot of details to be written into that joint declaration. And that was done. And at the time, I looked at it and I thought it was possible for that, for that to work. Although it would be very difficult because China is so vast and Hong Kong is no, so tiny. And I gave the example of a seesaw game which we all played when we were young. And if you have the father sitting here and the little boy sitting there, it goes like this. So to make it possible for that to be a game, the heavier guy, the father, would have to move towards the center of the plank until an equilibrium is struck. Then you've got the game. And I said at the time, it requires two essential conditions. One is that we must have democracy. So that our chief executive, top person in Hong Kong, and all members of the legislature must be elected by the people of Hong Kong, by universal suffrage. So they know that it is necessary for them to be always on Hong Kong's side whenever there is any dispute between Beijing and Hong Kong. Otherwise, Hong Kong people will not elect them for a second term. Mm. We need that system, democracy. The other thing is there mustn't be any interference from Beijing. Otherwise, it goes like that. In other words, China must make sure there is equilibrium, not for one year, but for all 30 years. And every day, and every hour, and every minute of those 50 years. Otherwise, it goes like this. But if you look at Hong Kong today, which is the 23rd year after the 1st of July 1997, they still don't have universal suffrage, and it's nowhere in sight. They don't even talk about it anymore. And as, as for intervention, it's now everywhere. So much so that the central government now claims that it has, in the white paper, which you mentioned, published in June 2014, that the central government has a comprehensive jurisdiction over Hong Kong. The better translation would be complete power of control over Hong Kong. And it is the exact opposite of what was promised to Margaret Thatcher and accepted by Hong Kong people. Instead of Hong Kong people, ruling Hong Kong is now central government, meaning the Chinese Communist Party, administering Hong Kong with complete power to control. So it's going to be like this. And that is why now you see our entire government side with Beijing. They don't hold on to that position anymore. They are on this side. Mm -hmm. And it is only we, those who are not in government, keep on reminding Beijing, hey, and the Hong Kong government, you should be there. You should leave us alone. You should let us have democracy so that our leaders will find it necessary to stay there. And we must not interfere, which we have promised in the recent years. So the joint declaration was important because without that agreement with the British government, China could only take the new territories back and not Hong Kong nor Kowloon. And China got Hong Kong and Kowloon back post at the same time because of that agreement with Great Britain. And then the basic law was our mini constitution and China actually promised in the joint declaration that China would enact the basic law of Hong Kong setting out China's basic policies regarding Hong Kong, not only in the Joint Declaration, but also in the Basic Law, which is our main constitution. And that was done. And when the Basic Law was promulgated, the 4th of April 1990, the National People's Congress, which is the parliament in China, 
make a very important decision on the same day that Hong Kong was created in accordance with a provision of the Chinese constitution to set Hong Kong up as a special administrative region and to decide in the basic law, which we just passed, our mini constitution, that our systems and policies would be capitalist, capitalist system and policy, as opposed to socialist system and policy practiced in mainland China. So, and it's therefore, in that decision said, therefore, the Hong Kong basic law was, is constitutional. So that Hong Kong and the mainland China would coexist as separate entities. Imagine Hong Kong there, the mainland there. So in 1997, all of China, including Hong Kong, will operate as separate systems. The Chinese constitution will govern the whole of the mainland. Basic law will govern a little bit Hong Kong. For 50 years, everything will remain unchanged. So that was the idea. The basic law will govern us, the Chinese constitution will govern the media. But now, they say they are no longer subject to the basic law because these, the liaison office and the Hong Kong Macau Affairs office now claim that they are above the basic law and that they are not subject to any control. The basic law requires them not to interfere in Hong Kong's domestic matters and they say we are not subject to their control at all. And the basic law, Article 22, requires the personnel of these departments in Hong Kong to abide by our laws. So they cannot commit any criminal offence, but they say they are above, they are not subject to control of Article 22. That means they are above the basic law as well as above our law. Mm. Now that is completely opposite to what was promised to the British government back in the early 1980s or the people of Hong Kong, as well as the international community. Now why should the international community be concerned with Hong Kong? Because, because prior, just prior to the announcement of the Sino-British Joint Declaration on the 26th of September 1984, China and Britain worked very hard, lobbied very hard for the support of the international community. Primarily, the most important is the US government. That was uh, President Reagan at the time. So Margaret Thatcher lobbied for President Reagan's support of her agreement with Deng Xiaoping and lobbied the support of the Canadian government and many governments in Europe and so on. So they were afraid that if the joint declaration was not welcomed in Hong Kong by the Hong Kong people, the immigration tide would continue and our best people would leave Hong Kong together with the international investors. But, but that lobbying was very successful. And then all these governments came up in the open, applauded the joint declaration. So they supported, and they still support, the one country, two systems, basic policies regarding Hong Kong by Deng Xiaoping. And in the state, they even passed a law to give effect to the two systems. They treat Hong Kong as a separate system. Even in China, in terms of quotas, passport quotas, textile quotas in those days, they treating Hong Kong separately. So certain certain things could not be transferred from the USA to mainland China, but they could be brought into Hong Kong because they trust the Hong Kong system and so on. So that is why the international community, I believe and I say, owe Hong Kong people at least a moral obligation to speak up for us because they supported the joint declaration, the one country, two systems, and still support it. And something is going terribly wrong because Beijing is now spending the one country, two systems policy on its head. Mm -hmm. They want to control Hong Kong. 
including our court, not just the government, but our legislature. They express views as to how meetings should be conducted in the Legislative Council. They applauded the judgment of the Court of Appeal because they overturned the lower court judgment, which found that a law passed in haste by the chairman and the Executive Council and not through the Legislative Council was unconstitutional. The High Court gave the judgment against the government, the Court of Appeal corrected that, and the liaison office applauded openly. But that case is on its way to the Court of Final Appeal. So how can Beijing be allowed to do this, interfering with our judicial system, telling the judges of the Court of Final Appeal, hey, we applaud the lower court judge with the Court of Appeal's decision. You better know what to do. So they are damaging the Hong Kong system now because they want to make sure that the international community will now understand that Beijing wants to take back from Hong Kong the high degree of autonomy already given to us as per the Standard British Joint Declaration. That's why they say the Joint Declaration is no longer relevant. They already got Hong Kong and coming back together with the British territory. So they don't want the British territory to say anything to them. You are no longer relevant. But what I say is, is the opposite. Once the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region was set up, the Chinese, the, Chi the Chinese Constitution is no longer relevant to Hong Kong. Because for those 50 years, only the basic law would be relevant to Hong Kong. Not the Chinese Constitution. Mm. They, they go the other way. They say the China British Joint Declaration is no longer relevant. And the Chinese Constitution now will take its place. So they want to run Hong Kong according to the Chinese Constitution. This is ridiculous. Because the Chinese Constitution requires the whole of China to adopt and continue to adopt socialist policies and the socialist system. How can that sit side by side with the Hong Kong Basic Law, which says we must operate under a capitalist system, including a capitalist legal system, which is the common law, and capitalist policies? So they're, they're, I don't know what they, whether they understand what they're doing. And the important thing, therefore, is the white paper there, and now with their every intention to implement the white paper, replacing Deng Xiaoping's one country, two system with Xi Jinping's one country, two system. And the big question I have to ask is what is the British government going to do about it? Mm. Thank you very much for, for that uh, extremely helpful and, and detailed explanation. Just picking up <clears throat> on your last point, uh, my next question was going to be, uh, if you found yourself in a room with the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, what would you ask him to do? What, what would you say to him? I would first of all congratulate him, uh, being still alive, <laughs> uh, the proud father of a little boy. Yeah. And I would then say, as Prime Minister now of Great Britain, what is your government going to do about Hong Kong? Mm. And don't believe that if you stand on principle over Hong Kong, China will not give you China trade. It doesn't work like that. Mm. In fact, they respect you. They respect you secretly if you stand on principle. And don't believe those many old China hands uh, advising them. Mm. That if you defend Hong Kong, you will lose business. You will, lose, will be cut off entirely. China trade it doesn't happen like that. Mm. If they need your your goods, they will buy your goods from you. But if you are in the pocket, then they'll give you a, a few trade deals. They will do three trade deals from time to time, but they don't respect you. And the big ones, they won't give to you mm. because you're already in the pocket. You're uh, known as the father of the democracy movement. Looking back uh, over the 23 years since the handover, what would you say are the two or three 
pivotal moments in the uh, development of the democracy movement. You've spoken about the challenges to to the movement. What what are the two or three moments in the in the democracy movement that you highlight? First of all, I don't like that name, Father of Democracy, because there's still no democracy. Yeah. And if you say Martin is the father of democracy, then people will start to fold their arms and wait for me to get democracy for Hong Kong. Mm. So I don't yes. want that. Please, okay. Now, but thinking back, I think there is certainly a very important turning point, and that is the 1st of July 2003. Because that was a terrible year for Hong Kong. There was a SARS epidemic, so our economy was at rock bottom, and uh, confidence was zero, and, uh, and that was, we were threatened by China to pass a piece of legislation, uh, national security legislation, if you like, under Article 23 of the Basic Law, which would have eroded three of our basic freedoms of the press, of uh, free assembly, and of um, religion. So we opposed. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought that we would lose. And, um, and then the bill would have been passed into law uh, on the 9th of July. That was the date, the diary for the legislative process. So even after a few more days debate, it would be passed into law because we could not stop it. We don't have the numbers. But earlier, in mid-June, um, I... The White House published a statement under President Bush saying that the Article 23 legislation should not be enacted, that the US president was against it, and called upon the Hong Kong government to institute democracy in Hong Kong as promised. And, uh, as a result of that, many governments spoke up to oppose it. And Hong Kong people took courage because we know we are not fighting alone. And so on that day, which was the sixth anniversary of Hong Kong becoming part of China again, over half a million people took to the streets. Mm -hmm. And that changed the whole scene. When people were there, they were happy. They see so many people together and their cause the then chief executive, first of all, to delay the further reading of the bill, and later on he actually withdrew it, so that it's still not there today. That was a big turning point. And, um, but for that, the pro-Beijing political party called the DAB, um, Democratic Alliance for the Betterment of Hong Kong and so on, DAB, which are called Democracy According to Beijing, that party would have overtaken my party, the Democratic Party, if this bill had not been handled so badly. Mm. If they had, if we had presented a bill which is consistent with our human rights, we would have supported it because there's a duty on us to pass that bill. But if we introduced a bill which would have cut into those three basic freedoms, so we propose amendments, and we won't have anything of that. We approve all our amendments, and so we opposed. And but for the people of Hong Kong turning up, that bill would have been passed. Mm -hmm. Now it's still not passed, but they are not threatening to pass it quickly enough. They are even looking at just the next month or two. They mm -hmm. don't want to wait for the legislative council election in September. Although some pro Beijing people have spoken out to say, "No, don't don't push that too far. Don't rush that." Otherwise, they are, free, they are afraid that they will lose the legislative council elections to the Democrats, which will be almost impossible because the, the, the electoral laws are so bent against us. They, have, they, they still have this functional constituency, one company, one vote, that sort of thing, uh, which no country now has. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Italy had it under Mussolini. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, I think Indonesia um, had it, uh, or 
recently. But this is totally undemocratic. And it's because of that, they have always can take control of our legislative council. And they are afraid of losing, even though the law is so staked against them. Because they were so afraid. Uh, in uh, Last year, in our November elections in the district council, we overwhelmed them completely. Mm. And I couldn't believe that the voter turnout rate could be over 70%. I thought 40 odd percent would be high. Mm. But in fact, it was 70 odd percent. It's impossible. And yet we did it. So mm. they're afraid that the Hong Kong people will all line up, queue up in, in our police stations again and to elect our candidate. But this time it's much more difficult because we have proportional representation. Mm. And uh, it's very, very difficult, if, if not impossible. But mm. they're scared. And they will do all sorts of things to prevent that from happening. And we shall see. Mm. I think how many people will certainly vote in large numbers. Mm. Thank you. Um, we've seen over the last few years, uh, perhaps starting with uh, the umbrella movement, and then of course, uh, over the last year with the anti-extradition bill demonstrations, we've seen a, a new generation of uh, pro-democracy activists uh, in Hong Kong, a, a young generation. What would your message be uh, to the young generation, to the new generation who are the future of Hong Kong, but the, they're asking the question, do they have a future? I think they will have a future because they care for Hong Kong. Um, they don't see much for themselves, but they're prepared to sacrifice even their lives, because I, I know that um, at the beginning of uh, this uh, movement against this extradition bill, some young students in their early teens would go and uh, they are prepared even to use some minor degree of force. Um, and they have written wills and carry the sexual, put a will there in case something happened to them. It really breaks my heart to know that. that these young people are fighting for their own future. And that is why I felt so relieved when finally the police arrested me and prosecuted me. So many of them have been arrested and prosecuted already. So many of them. And of course, I do not believe that the correct way, the correct thing to do is to use any degree of violence. And I would certainly hope that they will let us, the older people, to continue their fight in Hong Kong. And I hope no more violence will be used. I don't want them to be hurt. Mm. Uh, because it's not necessary now for any force to be used. The world's attention has been focused on Hong Kong because of them. And, uh, and I hope the, the government of uh, democratic countries would help Hong Kong by making sure that China would just honor her own promises contained in this international treaty registered with the United Nations and enshrined in our own basic law, which China drafted with some help from Hong Kong people. And that's all we ask. I, I don't really want to, to see young people hurting themselves again or being hurt again by our police. And I hope the whole world will see that this has become a police state. Mm. The police is about the law. None of them has been arrested or charged with any offence, even though there was so much evidence captured on television and uh, uh, on videos of policemen actually assaulting these young people after arresting them when they were not resisting. Blood all over their face as they hit them, knocked their head on the street. And, and so on. So, how can it? How can we claim there's a rule of law in Hong Kong mm. when, on the one side, when these protesters are arrested and they are prosecuted, and on the other side, when such atrocities are committed by the police, none of them is prosecuted for that. Mm. And they say, and they still, and they, on the other hand, they they accuse the protesters of 
breaking the rule of law, or damaging the rule of law. How can anybody damage the rule of law when they are arrested and charged for their offenses and they're given a fair trial, given the right of appeal? Mm. But on this side, when you see clear offenses committed and not pursued by the police, then there's a serious damage to the rule of law. Mm. And so I hope the young people will join with us. We continue our fight for democracy, but I hope for their sake, no more violence at all. But don't you think, though, that uh, Ben, that every act of violence was actually committed by the protesters? Mm. Because we know that some policemen, in fact, just dress themselves up in black with a funny mask, so they look like ordinary protesters. Mm. But they are captured by television of arresting the next guy and bringing him to a police car. So this guy actually was a policeman. And there was a trial in Hong Kong which showed that a policeman actually got people right, from the underground to dress up as these protesters and to throw Molotov cocktails into the living quarters of policemen and their families in the yard. Not hitting, not hurting anybody. So these things were actually thrown by the policemen and the agents. So be very careful. And these guys were never arrested and prosecuted mm. because they know that they are going people. So, but I don't like violence at all. Mm. And we always believe that we should keep the moral high ground mm. by doing this peacefully. But I can understand the students when they use some degree of force on the 12th of June last year, which stopped the provincial legislators from going into the Legislative Council. Otherwise, that extradition bill would have been passed, if not on that day, then on the following day. Mm -hmm. And I would be, together with other people, would be tried, not prosecuted or tried in Hong Kong, but prosecuted and tried in a Chinese court, in mainland mm -hmm. China. According to Chinese law, mm -hmm. and served by a period of imprisonment, served my sentence in China. Mm -hmm. And if they, they are already saying that I'm a traitor, and that is the death penalty, mm -hmm. for treason in China. So the students, the young people, did something for Hong Kong by using some minor degree of force. But so they, in a way, they saved the Hong Kong community. Because we don't have that extradition bill passed into law. But even then, I hope they will not use any more violence because they, they are getting serious, long jail sentences. Mm. If they use any degree of force for violence. Mm. That's a, a very sobering uh, thought, an important thought. Um, we're very, we're almost out of time, but could I ask you one uh, very final brief question or two questions put together? You um, referred briefly to how you felt uh, when you were arrested on the 18th of April. Could you say a little bit more about what went through your mind when you saw the police officers coming to arrest you? And, and secondly, you would have every reason uh, some years ago to have uh, retired, to have said, uh, I, I've done my part, I, I'm going to enjoy retirement. You're still going in your early 80s. What keeps you going? Well, I actually decided um, back in the early 1980s not to leave Hong Kong because I just, I just, I just think of the moment, say I'm on a plane flying away from Hong Kong and I would say, where my people need me and other people to fight their fight for them and with them, how, how can I just leave them there? So back, back in those years, I already decided not to leave Hong Kong. So I do have a foreign passport and I, continue, I will continue to fight. I will not give up because I believe so long as I don't give up, I have not failed. But the moment I give up, that's my failure. Right? So I will continue doing that because I believe that the one country, two systems is not only good for Hong Kong, but for China and for Taiwan. And since it was already enshrined in this 
international treaty and our basic law, our mini constitution, we must go for that. We mustn't let China to break it at will. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for joining us. And uh, this brings to an end our first session of uh, the, this series, but we'll have other guests in the coming weeks. But Martin Lee, thank you so much. My pleasure. Bye-bye.